الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا حي يا قيوم We ask Allah Azza wa Jal after praising him and asking Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his family and his companions we ask Allah to teach us what will benefit us and to benefit us with what he teaches us and to increase us in knowledge this is the first proper lesson which we're going to be doing in this masjid on a Friday in relation to tafsir the previous lesson was just a recap or an introduction and inshallah ta'ala we're going to move on to the next surah in the series if anyone's wondering where the other ones have gone, that is Surah Al-Fatiha and An-Nas, Al-Falaq, Al-Ikhlas, Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab wa Tab and so on, those were done in Dubai and you can find those on youtube.com forward slash Muhammad Tim, that's M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D-T-I-M. You can find it on there and you can watch the other, the tafsir of the other surahs from there inshaAllah ta'ala. So we're not going to take too long, inshaAllah ta'ala. We're going to try to finish within about half an hour. And today we have the tafsir of Al-Hakumut Takathur. Al-Hakumut Takathur. Hatta zurtum al-maqabir kalla sawfa ta'lamun thumma kalla sawfa ta'lamun kalla law ta'lamun ilm al-yaqeen لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينِ ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ So the very first thing we're going to talk about is the name of the surah. So it's well known and it's you, most people know it as Surah Al-Takathur. Because this is a word which is unique to the surah or it's prominent in the surah Al-Hakumut-Takathur So for that reason it's most commonly known among the majority as Surah Al-Takathur And we're going to come to what Al-Takathur means inshaAllah ta'ala as we go through the explanation but that's one of the names the other name that it's known by is Surah Al-Hakum because that's the first word in the surah, right? So it's known as surah al-hakum. And like we said, we could give an example. Uh, surah al-masad is also known as surah tabbat yada abi lahab wa tab and so on. Sometimes they're known by the first ayah and they have their own name as well. So it's known as surah al-takathur and it's known as surah al-hakum. It's also said that it's known as Surah Al-Maqbara, the Surah of the Cemetery. And that is because this is also a prominent word in the Surah. Hatta zurtumul maqabir. Maqabir is the plural and the singular is maqbara, the grave or the cemetery. So here it's also said, although not very, it's not a very famous name for it, but it's said that one of the names, and it said some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to call it Surah Al-Maqbara, but this requires maybe some more research into who said it and whether it's authentic or not, but that's perhaps a third name you might hear for the Surah. The Surah is Makkiya. It was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was in Makkah in the Meccan period. That is the first 13 years of his prophethood sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah azza wa jal begins the surah al-hakum al-hakum al-takathur so here al-hakum it's a really really interesting word 
And what's interesting about it is there's a superficial translation and there's a deep translation. So the superficial translation of al-hakum is ashghalakum, it made you busy. You became busy, you became preoccupied and busy. That's fine and that's what the word means. That's why if you look in a simple translation, it will say you have become preoccupied with a takathur. We're coming to a takathur in a minute. You've become preoccupied and busy with takathur. But actually, the word al-hakum, where does it come from? It comes from the Arabic word lahu. And if you frequently read the Quran, you hear two words come together. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَعِبٌ وَلَهُ The worldly life, the life of this world, is nothing more than la'ib and lahu. These two words come together a lot. La'ib, lahu. So in here, the word lahu is used. al hakum. It's a lahu for you. So what's the difference between these two words and what can we learn from it? Many of the scholars, they said, a lahu is when your heart becomes busy with something. And a la'ib, joking around and playing around, is when your limbs become busy with something or preoccupied with something. So if somebody's always playing football, we've got the video on, so we'll have to say soccer for those people who don't understand what football is. And they're never ever concerned with their religion. We call this la'ib. They're playing around. When someone's heart is attached to something, we call it lahu. When their heart, and that's why often the words related to sort of music and people who are obsessed with it and they're listening to it instead of the Quran, we call it lahu. Because their heart is attached to it. It's their heart that's connected to it. So now we need to just, before we come back to this, we need to talk about at takathur So at takathur comes from the Arabic word kathir or kathra, a lot. And the word takathur kind of indicates that whatever this thing of a lot is, it's kind of a mutual thing. It's kind of tanafus. You're competing with each other in al kathra in getting lots and lots. You're competing with each other, and we get that from the takathur, that gives us the meaning of a tanafus, of competition and fighting with each other in al kathra in getting lots and lots of things. Now here, many of the scholars of Islam talk about naturally money, right? You have become, your hearts have become preoccupied with competing, competing with each other for worldly gains, for money. But that's not actually the meaning here. The meaning here, takathur, doesn't mention money at all, even though money is the first thing that comes to mind. Takathur is anything in which people compete with each other for kathra. To have a lot of it. And here the competition, it has to be madhmoom, blameworthy, not praiseworthy. So we can't say competing with each other for beneficial knowledge, competing with each other in sadaqah, competing with each other for righteous actions. We can't say this. Why? Because Allah said, al hakum, your heart became preoccupied with it instead of Islam and instead of what matters and instead of what Allah has commanded you to do, your heart's become preoccupied. So this has to be, it can be anything people compete with to get lots of, but it has to be something blameworthy in the sense that competing for it and your heart becoming attached to it is blameworthy. So let's just start by talking about money. And here is where the word al-hakum really comes into play. Because as we said, al-hakum is when your heart becomes busy with it. And you can have somebody who is completely bankrupt, muflis, bankrupt, doesn't have anything. But his heart is full of money. His hand's empty, miskeen, Allah, miskeen, poor guy. His hand is empty, his heart is full of money to the point there is no space left for anything else. How am I going to get it? How am I going to do this? How will I get it? What will happen when I'm rich? And his heart is just full of competing with the next person and the next person in gathering together money. 
And that's why the word al-hakum is so relevant here, because it doesn't matter whether he is rich or, or poor. He can still be from those people about whom Allah said, al-hakum takathur because his heart became busy with it. His heart is constantly preoccupied with getting more of everything. And competing with other people, because the word takathur indicates that kind of competition. Competing with each other in getting more, i.e. having more than the other one. And there are many, many uh, narrations about this. Perhaps one we can mention is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لو كان لابن آدم واديين من مال if the children or if the son of Adam had two valleys of wealth, he would wish for a third. That's the meaning of al-hakum al takathur To the point that there is a, an ayah in the Qur'an like this which is mansukha, it's abrogated. Now a lot of people, maybe you, you heard this word before, abrogated, maybe you came across it before. But there are different types of abrogation, not too much right now, but just to me, the, the meaning of this one is it was an ayah that used to be recited, but it's no longer recited in the Quran as the pro when the Prophet passed away. The Quran that he he recited it in the earlier period, but then he didn't, it became uh, it no longer became it, it was no longer part of the Quran that he recited at the end of his life. That's one kind of abrogation. And the other kind is when the ayah is there, but the ruling goes away. So the, the ayah is still there and we still recite the ayah today, but the ruling has been replaced with another ruling. And that's not surprising because Allah said, We do not cause an ayah to be abrogated or to be forgotten, except that we bring equal to it or we bring better than it or equal to it. So that is something which happened in the Qur'an during the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So let's not confuse afterwards and start talking about ayat that were abrogated when Uthman wrote the Mus'haf. It's nothing like that. This is something that during the life of the Prophet ﷺ, he used to recite and then he stopped reciting it. But the ruling here remained and it was similar to this, to do with the children of Adam wishing for another valley. And then when Allah revealed Al-Hakum Al-Takathur, the Prophet ﷺ stopped to reciting the, the other ayah. Al-Hakum Al-Takathur. Now we said that Takathur here, it doesn't have to be related to wealth. And that was the statement of Ibn Jarir Al-Tabari, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Al-Qayyim, Rahimahumullah. They said in anything, even in children, people compete in terms of who can have, who has the most offspring, who has the most number of boys, who has all these things that people compete. People even compete when it comes to religious things without seeking the face of Allah. For example, people competing for knowledge, for knowledge sake. Oh, I have a doctorate. I have, you know, I have a professorship. I have three. I have four. I have this. God, even buying books. I have more books than you, My book, I, I collect rare books. Anything people collect and compete with each other in that takes them away from Allah. Because remember, we said it has to be blameworthy. That's why Allah said, Al-Hakum. Otherwise, it, it would be, there are things you can compete with that are praiseworthy. Or there are things you can gather that are praiseworthy. But here we're talking about the blameworthy things. So somebody, and, and one of the mashayikh, he gave a beautiful, beautiful example. He said competing for followers on social media. And I think that is a, an absolutely amazing, amazing example. Al-Hakum al-Takathur. You've become preoccupied competing with numbers. Who has more? That's what takathur means. Competing as to who has more. Who's got more followers? Who's got more likes? Who's got more views? And this could even happen to the talib ilm, to the scholar, to the sheikh, to the da'iya, to the student, to the righteous person. That they become so busy with, I want more. How many people came to your class? How many people came to your class? 
just competing for numbers. And as soon as you start competing for numbers and the numbers matter to you instead of what is with Allah, you fall under this ayah, Al-Hakum takathur In whatever those numbers are, could be your education, could be grades competing for who got the most nines or eights at GCSE, who got this, competing in anything that people compete with that takes you away from Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's a kind of lahu, it makes your heart busy with that thing instead of what it is that you're supposed to be busy with. Another example I really liked from a takathur is a takathur fil hajj. In hajj, can you imagine that? I made hajj 12 times. I made hajj 14 times. I made hajj 21 times. People competing with each other in the number of times they made hajj. What may you drink? What will make you know that even one was accepted? Competing with each other. And sometimes, you know, not even asking was the wealth halal, just com pure competition that takes you away from Allah. So don't think it should only be money and it should only be the dunya. It can even be the deen, but in a way that's blameworthy. It's not about numbers. And our religion is not about numbers. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, النبي, that there will be a Prophet that will come يوم القيامة وليس معه أحد. And there will be nobody who answered his call at all. That Prophet will be better than you, better than me, better than all of those du'at and scholars, better than those people who have got 100,000 shahat people accepted Islam at their hands, and that Prophet is better than all of them. And yet nobody answered his call. Nobody. Nobody came with him at all. So don't think our deen is not about numbers. Our da'wah is not about numbers. The way we tell people about Islam is not about numbers. Sometimes people say that to you. How many shahadas have you taken? Allah, that, that question, it, it pains me. And if someone says that to you, say to them, Al-Hakum takathur Does the number matter? Or does it matter which one was accepted by Allah? Does it matter how many of them stayed Muslim? Does it matter how many of them did, did that benefit you? Did Allah accept from you? And, and put it on your account for Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So none of this thing, don't just think about the dunya, it's about anything in which people compete for numbers instead of or at the expense of the religion of Al-Islam and sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Hakum al-Takathur hatta zurtum al-Maqabir Until, and I'm going to tell you the literal translation first and then we'll go into what it means. Until you visit the graves. Until you visit the graves, or you visit the cemeteries, until you visit the graves. Most of the scholars, the vast majority of the scholars, they said that the meaning of visit the graves means that you die and you are buried in the graveyard, in the cemetery. But then there comes a question, why did Allah describe it as ziyara, visiting? That makes it strange, right? Like if it was visiting the graves, like, like you and me, we go to the graveyard and we remember death and then we come back. But the overwhelming majority of the scholars of tafsir, they said that's not the meaning of the ayah here. The meaning of the ayah, hatta zurtum al-maqabir, meaning until you die and you are buried in the graves. So why did Allah call it ziyara? Why did Allah say you are visiting the graveyard? To show the temporary nature of the time that you're there. And the fact that even though you're buried in that grave, and even though there's been people buried in their graves since the time of Nuh, alayhi salam, since the time after Adam, alayhi salam, there's been people buried in their graves, and still Allah terms it ziyara, a quick visit, in comparison to the length of the qiyamah, and the length of everlasting life in Jannah, or in the fire, well, Iyadu Billah. We ask Allah's refuge from that. <laughs> so Allah called it ziyara because it's tem very temporary. It's very temporary. And there are some other 
uh, opinions about that. Some of the scholars, they said the meaning of the ziyarah, the visiting here is that the people even compete regarding the dead. Some of them said this. So they go to the graveyard and say, see all of the martyrs, most of them are from my tribe. We have more martyrs in our tribe than you have in your tribe. We have more Muslims buried here than you do. More of my relatives passed away in Islam than yours did. Some of them said that they even compete in the dead. They finish competing in the dunya. They finish competing in what doesn't benefit from the insincere actions in the religion until they even competed with each other in, with dead people, with regard to dead people. We have more you know, history than this. We had more of these people than you. We had more uh, umara, more leaders, more princes in our family than you did, and so on. But the majority said no. It means until you pay that temporary short visit that is to be buried in the graveyard. And this gives us a really, really clear uh, lesson, which is that for all you compete with each other in the dunya, and for all some people have lots of money and some people don't have much money at all, but when you go to the graveyard, when you visit the graveyard and you pass away and your body is taken there, everything is the same. You don't get anything different to anyone else. The graveyard is the same graveyard. The place where you are buried is the same size grave. The sheet that you're wrapped in is the same kind of sheet that everybody else is wrapped in. The people who, you know, the way people behave and the things people do, it's the same for everybody. So the thing which cuts off the takathur, the constantly competing with each other that I've got more than you, you've got more than me, and so on, is when you're buried in the grave and you see that everybody is exactly the same and there's no difference between them. And in reality, the person who had a lot of wealth was just a custodian for that wealth, really. They didn't actually, did that wealth, I mean, one of the mashayikh he said, very, very beneficial point. One of the very beneficial point he said, he said, uh, you know, for all these people gather all of this wealth, but there comes a point when you can't really do much more with it. You know, you can only drive one car at a time. You can only wear one set of clothing at a time. You can only wear one pair of shoes at a time. You can only sleep in one bed at a time. There comes to a point where all of this competition, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't benefit. And yet you still see people who say, when I reach this amount, I'll stop. And that's one of the, one of the, the things about takathur, about competing for numbers, is you never ever stop. If you get into that habit, you never ever stop. So you look, you know, when I get to this amount, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop competing. I'm going to slow down. Maybe think about my deen. Think about learning Islam. Maybe think about memorizing Quran. But you see, he gets to a million, he wants two. He gets to two, he wants ten. He gets to ten, he wants a hundred. He gets to a hundred, he wants a billion. And he doesn't stop. Because you look at the billionaires who are out there, have they stopped? Did any of them, very rarely, do any, does anyone stop and say, that's it, I, I've done enough of the takathur. It just doesn't stop. Until that person is buried in the grave. And then they realize that actually they were just a custodian. Because most of that money will pass on to somebody else. Most of it, they couldn't benefit from it. How much can you actually personally benefit from in any one particular time? And in reality, if you're just holding it in order to give it to somebody else who's going to come along after you. And the reality of that is seen when the person is buried in the grave and the relatives squabble over who gets the wealth and the wealth just passes on from one person to another. And how much did that person really use, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis for themselves? Kalla sawfa ta'lamun. Thumma kalla sawfa ta'lamun. Allah Azza wa Jal said, kalla. Kalla here, we said again, is a, a word which means it has zajr in it. It's a rebuke. It's a rebuke from Allah. So it's not a word like uh, just no. Kalla is a word that contains a rebuke. No way, you're wrong. It contains that kind of rebuke. Kalla, no way. So for ta'lam, you're going to come to know the reality of what? The reality of that takathur that you wasted your life with. 
in Surah Al-Asr, we, we mentioned in Tafsir that the only thing you really have as a guarantee in terms of the only thing you really have that you can really trade with and do business with is the number of breaths that you have. Those limited fixed number of breaths that Allah has given to every person. You don't know how many you have, but whatever Allah has written for you, that's your Ra'as al-Mal. That's what you have to trade. That's your, you know, that's the money, that's your capital that you have to actually invest and, and work with. Ultimately, in reality, when someone dies and when someone sees that and the person is taken to the graveyard, the person will come to know. They'll come to know the reality of all of that gathering and hoarding that they did. Then Allah Azza said, Thumma kalla sawfa ta'lamun. Thumma is a word which means then again. And then, no, you will surely come to know. So, why did Allah Azza wa Jal repeat this twice? Bear in mind, there is a rule. We have a very hard and fast rule. There is no repetition in the Quran. Okay. Someone says that's a difficult one because, for example, فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ comes a lot of times, right? In Surah Rahman. How can you say there's no repetition? We mean there's no repetition for repetition's sake. There are no words that mean the same thing. One ayah, another ayah equals. There is doesn't exist. Every single one is mentioned for a separate benefit, which is different to the benefit of the first. So every time فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ comes in Surah Rahman, every meaning is different from the other one i.e. The, the purpose, the reason behind it, the benefit from it is different in every single one. And that is because the Qur'an is the most pure and the most eloquent of language. And one of the conditions of eloquence is you don't waste words. So Allah Azza wa doesn't waste words and doesn't repeat words except for a clear need that is there and a clear reason an interpretation, each one has its own benefit and its own reason for it. So for example, in Surah Rahman, when each one comes, each one connects to denying the blessing that Allah mentioned before it, for example. So why here are these two things mentioned? There are two opinions. Some of the scholars of tafsir, they said, uh, some of the scholars of tafsir, they said this is a style of Arabic that the Arabs used, and remember the Qur'an is in classical Arabic, right? So one of the styles of Arabic, and that style of Arabic is whenever the Arabs wanted to do something we call taghlil, they wanted to really, you know, to really hammer the point home and really show how serious it was, they would say it twice. That's a style of Arabic that existed prior to the revelation of the Qur'an, that, that in poetry and so on, that when they wanted to really hammer a point home, they would repeat it, they would repeat it twice. The other opinion, and this is the opinion of uh, Al-Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, uh, before him it's the opinion of uh, Al-Hasan, Al-Basri and others, is that the first one, Kalla sawfa ta'lamun, it refers to at the moment of death. That while the person is dying, they realize the reality of all that gathering and competing for numbers and hoarding that they had. They realize it when they died. And the second time they realize it is when they are in the grave. Or when they are taken out of the grave and so on. In other words, there are two times when, it, when they realize the reality of the wealth they hoarded. When they are dying and when they enter into the life of the barzakh, the life of the grave. And others, they said, it's not like that. Rather, what it is, is it is a style of Arabic whereby to emphasize a point and to drive it home, you mention that point twice. Like once and then again with thumma. And that's a style of Arabic which is, is intended for emphasis. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala strongly preferred the second, that the two are different, based upon the principle that I told you that, generally speaking, we take the principle that every ayah has its own unique tafsir, 
even if the words are repeated. And if you guys go to the video on Surat Al-Kafirun, we talk a lot about that in Surat Al-Kafirun, which we had done the tafsir of already. Kalla, law ta'lamuna ilm al-yaqeen. Kalla law ta'lamuna ilm al-yaqeen. Again, kalla comes again. Again, rebuking them, rebuking them for the takathur and the competing with each other for numbers and wealth and things like that. And here, Allah Azza wa Jal tells them that you will come to know ilm al yaqeen the knowledge of certainty. Because knowledge is of different levels, right? Like there are things that you are fairly sure about and then there are things that you are certain about that you have absolutely no doubt over at all. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu he has a statement he said ma ra'aytu yaqeenan ashbahu bishak min al maut aw kama qal he said he said i have never seen anything certain more have a stronger resemblance to death to doubt than death i'll try that again i have never seen anything more cer- anything certain have a stronger resemblance to doubt than death death is absolutely certain and yet everybody behaves like they doubt it that's what he means radiyallahu an death is absolutely certain you know, like they say that famous statement that, you know, there are two things you can be certain of in life, death and taxes, yeah? The taxes we have doubt over. Maybe there are some places you won't pay it. But death is a certainty. Death is a yaqeen. Everybody has ilm yaqeen that they're going to die. Yet everybody behaves as though they don't. Everybody behaves as though they're not quite sure or maybe it won't happen to them. And that's why he said that I've not seen something certain more have a stronger resemblance to doubt than death mean the way people behave as though it is doubtful and yet it is something which is absolutely certain if you were to know and Allah said law ta'lamun if you were to know the knowledge of yaqeen if you really had yaqeen the meaning here we take is if you really had yaqeen if you really had certainty you wouldn't be from those people who gathered all that those things together and competed with each other in it. That's the meaning of لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ If you had that certainty, if you were to have that proper certainty in what is going to happen to you in your death and the grave and يوم Qiyamah and the Hisab, the account and Jannah and the fire, if you had knowledge with certainty of that, you wouldn't be from the people that Allah said al hakum al and so if you see in yourself that desire to compete in the worldly life and compete for things that don't benefit you, understand that the fundamental problem is that the, that the yaqeen isn't what it should be. The certainty in death isn't what it should be. And one of the solutions to that is to go and visit the graves, not as a person who is dying and being buried there, but to go and visit them to remind you of death and to increase your certainty so that this will remove this takathur from you. One of the ways to remove that, that desire to compete with each other in the worldly life is, and pre, you know, heart being preoccupied by it, is to visit the graveyards uh, and to see the people buried. Now here there's something interesting. We don't join these two ayat here. We don't say Kalla law ta'lamuna ilm al yaqeen la tarawunna al jahim. We don't join them here. Because this ayah la tarawunna al jahim is not connected to the ayah before it. It's not connected. La tarawunna here is part of a sentence. The first part of the sentence has been removed. And that happens a lot in Arabic that we remove a part of the sentence uh, and it's understood. So it's understood as being a qasim, as an oath. Wallahi la tarawunna al jahim. By Allah, you will certainly see Jahannam. Here we come to an interesting question. Is this surah directed towards the believers or the disbelievers? 
Dahak, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that the first kalla sawfa ta'lamun, you certainly know, is towards the disbelievers. Thumma kalla sawfa ta'lamun, and the second one is towards the believers, or the other way around. He mentioned that one is for one and one is for the other. Why would people take this away from being for the Muslims? Some of them said, الجحيم, Can we say that for a Muslim? You're going to definitely see Jahannam. You're going to definitely see Jahannam. Is that something we can say for a Muslim? Or is that indicating it's only towards the non-Muslims? Rather, this indicates everybody. Why? Allah said, That every single one of you is going to pass over the fire. Every one of you. So the fact that you see Jahannam doesn't necessitate you will enter Jahannam. And that was an issue that one of the wives of the Prophet anha, she had an issue. She said to the Messenger of Allah that how can it be? How can it be that everyone, what she understood from the word warid is everyone will go into Jahannam. She said, how can it be that everyone will go into Jahannam? But the Prophet ﷺ recited the ayah or the one or two ayat afterwards. That then we will uh, save those people who had taqwa and we will put the oppressive people, we will put them down on their knees in it. So this tells us that you passing over the fire and seeing the fire doesn't mean that you'll necessarily enter the fire. So that this saying that you'll certainly see, Wallahi, by Allah, you're definitely going to see Jahannam, doesn't mean necessarily that you will be from the people of Jahannam. And there's no reason why a Muslim is prohibited from entering Jahannam, but he won't remember, remain or she won't remain in Jahannam forever if they were a Muslim and they had the minimum requirements to be a Muslim, then they won't be from the people who are eternally in the hellfire. And of course, we all hope that none of us will be from the people who enter it at all. But as for passing over it, this is something which everyone must go through. Every one of you will go over it. You will certainly see, and again here it said, you will certainly see the fire, i.e. you will certainly see the people being punished in the fire. And from those people who are punished in the fire are those people who they became, their hearts got preoccupied with competing in numbers and gathering and having more of things. And that could be a reason why they were from the people of uh, the fire. And again, ilm al yaqeen here, that would indicate that ilm al yaqeen is mushahada. It's to actually visually see it. That when you have that absolute certainty, or that would be the Ayn al yaqeen That would be Ayn al yaqeen sorry. The next ayah. ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا Ayn al yaqeen So Ilm al yaqeen would be the knowledge that you had that made you certain that it was going to happen. And then Ayn al yaqeen when you finally see it with your own eyes. And you see, and that is a level of certainty which is higher than the certainty that you gain through knowledge. And that's why Ibrahim uh, he said, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى قَالَ أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ قَالَ بَلَى وَلَكِنْ لِيَطْمَئِنَّ قَلْبِي When Ibrahim said to his Lord, My Lord, let me see how you cause the death, the dead to come to life. Allah said, do you not believe? He said, rather I do believe, but to, for my heart to have increased tranquility. And that is the difference between ilm al yaqeen and Ayn al yaqeen Ibrahim was not requesting Iman, he was requesting a level of Yaqeen higher than the Yaqeen that he already had, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Certainty through seeing it. Thumma la tarawunnaha Ayn al yaqeen Then you will see it with your own eyes. Thumma la tusalunna yawma idhin anin na'im And then, on that day, you will certainly be asked about the blessings. What are the blessings that you will be asked about? There are so many ahadith. We don't want to go too many into too many. But the basic answer is ni'am, All of the blessings. The Prophet ﷺ told us that the first thing from the blessings that a person will be asked about يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ 
is al-ma'ul barid, is cold water. You imagine, we don't even think, we, we complain about cold water, you know, subhanAllah sometimes, and or hot water. We subhanAllah to have, open the tap and have cold water. Every time you drank a glass of cold water from the tap, Allah Azza wa Jal will ask you about it. ثُمَّ لَا تُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ And the first thing you'll be asked about is that, did you show gratitude to Allah Azza wa Jal? And you think about the life we live, we live such a, a, a very, very, what's the word, such an, a, a, a sheltered life with so many blessings in it and so many things made easy for us. We have heating and then in hot countries we have AC and fans and generally we, are, we live a very, very, very comfortable life. Even the worst among us on, and the least, the, in the most difficulty among us lives a very comfortable life compared to people of the past. And yet every one of these blessings you'll be asked about it in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet mentioned in other ahadith being asked about food, being asked about water. He mentioned ni'matani maqboonun fihi kathirun min nas as-sihha wal faraq. He said there are two blessings that most people do not show gratitude for. Health and free time. All of these things you'll be asked about. And he mentioned that the, the foot of a person will not move from its place يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ until he's asked about four things and one of the things will be asked about وَعَنْ مَالِهِ Where did he مِنْ أَيْنَ اكْتَسَبَهُ وَفِيمَا أَنْفَقَ He'll be asked about his wealth. How did he earn it? How did he spend it? These are all from the na'im that you'll be asked about. And this requires مُحَاسَبَةُ nafs, Taking yourself to account and asking yourself about all the blessings. You can't get all of them. If you try to count all the blessings, you won't be able to, you won't be able to get all of them. But you try to remember the blessings of Allah and you try to ask yourself, am I showing gratitude? I'malu ala Dawood shukra. Act, O family of Dawood, in gratitude. Gratitude is about saying, I saying Alhamdulillah and so on, and about acting in a way that shows you're grateful for what you've been given. So you've been given a, a nice place to live, use it for the worship of Allah, use it to obey Allah. As for being given a nice bed to sleep in and then not waking up for Fajr, that's not shukr. Allah gave you that beautiful place to sleep and you misused it. And that's from the things you'll be asked about. ثُمَّ لَا تُسْأَلُنَّ that's what Allah is made easy for us to mention when a little bit longer than I was hoping for. But we finished the surah and that's kind of how we're going to go every Friday. Maybe one surah. If it's a short one, we might end up going through two. But usually it will just be one and we try to go through it in a little bit of detail. But not too much that people feel, you know, not too much that people feel kind of lost inshallah ta'ala. So that's what Allah Azza wa Jal made easy for us to mention and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. جزاكم الله خيرا for watching. Please subscribe, share, and you can visit muhammadtim.com.